I'm Don Dixon. I want to thank you for joining me again today for our structure fishing workshop. We're just uh, closing our discussion of lake types. We're finishing up with a Flatland II reservoir. These reservoirs are quite large and they're found really sort of in the central part of the country for the most part in the big river valleys, in the plain states, some of the coastal regions, but uh, you can find a Flatland II pretty much anywhere today. And they offer an awful lot when it comes to fishing opportunities. But they also cause most fishermen the most problems. <laughs> so we're going to try to eliminate those problems today and give you some keys of how to fish these great reservoirs. First, I want to show you a top view picture of what one of these big Flatland twos looks like. Uh, this would be a typical Flatland II reservoir. Now, it could be 30,000 acres, could be 50,000 acres, could be 100,000 acre impoundment. But I'm going to also now take and show you a side view of what most of them sort of look like if you're just taking that side view look. Okay, so as you're looking at that side view, I want to just give you a few absolutes in the Flatland too. We have short, shallow bars that don't reach to the channel. We have a long uh, channel winding through these big expansive flats and run for quite a distance. There's not a lot of depth in these reservoirs, but there is enough to sustain great fishing. But they're not as deep in the channel as a highland or, 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 or most lowlands. They're not quite as deep. Everything in these reservoirs pretty much from a fishing standpoint is reachable when you're talking about depths. So as we're looking at this side view, we have these short, shallow uh, bars. And then you see those long flats reaching out to the river channel and then breaking into the river channel. This is a typical Flatland II situation. And the closer you are uh, down towards the lower end of that reservoir, these flats can go for miles until it reaches the river channel. We're talking, this is big water now. But from a fishing standpoint, you've got to really come to grips with this. And the channel is the deepest water in these Flatland II reservoirs. And the channel is the home of the fish. So you can see some of the problems we have because fish, as we've studied before in basic movements, fish will not cross a flat unless it's well marked with something. They will not cross a flat. But yet we know we got all our fish out here in this channel. But what, they won't cross a flat to get to that short, uh, shallow uh, shoreline bar. They won't be there. And if you recall our discussion on structures, I gave an example of Tawakini Reservoir in, in Texas where I did an on-the-water school once. And we talked about finding the fish every day in the same exact spot. And we had a terrific school uh, because of it. <laughs> Even though the weather wasn't great, we had these fish pinpointed. And it was where we had a side feeder stream cut came down off of that hill and hit those flats and, and rolled all the way out until it got to the where it met up with the main river channel. It cut through the flats and met up with the main river channel and that created what we referred to in our discussion on structure as a two-sided bar. That's the contact point. And we said many, many times over for a structure to produce, it must lead all the way, all the way from the deepest water in the area to the shallows. And we designate, of course, the shallows is anything 8 to 10 feet or less. So if a structure doesn't lead all the way, it won't produce. But this side feeder stream cut and the break lines to the side feeder stream cut coming out to meet the river channel, the main river channel, gives the fish a route from the home, which is the main river channel, up that break line of the side feeder stream cut until it reaches the shallows. It gives them a route. So these two-sided bars are very important. And when you look at the lower end of, of the, one of these big flatlands, you can waste an awful lot of time if you're overcasting the shoreline. Let me tell you, those fish aren't there, period. They're out there. 
Now, we're going to talk about some keys of how you break these flatland twos down, but that's one of your keys. You do have natural structures in a flatland two. You have bars, two-sided bars. You have those worthless shallow bars, other than a seasonal condition. Uh, for the bulk of the season, those shoreline bars, even where you have them in conjunction with a side feeder stream cut, are not going to produce fish. They're too shallow. Most all the time you're running into fish, you're going to be out there at the contact point when you're fishing the natural structures in a flatland too. Now, we not only have natural structures in a flatland too, but we have man-made structures. And I'm just going to say right before we even start discussing it, that's my key to fishing a flatland two reservoir, period, exclamation point, end of the story. The number one key fishing a flatland two, man-made structure. Now I made the statement, man-made structure is the key to fishing a flatland two. I'm going to really break that down for you. But first I want to establish this in your mind. Most flatland two reservoirs, the older ones that were built years and years and years ago, were mainly all clear cut. The timber was removed. But today, most all of the Johnny Come Lately Flatland twos, they're not clear cut. They've got a bunch of standing trees, they've got stumps, they've got hangs, they've got problems trying to present a lure. And so when we start talking about the man made structure beginning at the dam, we know even in the newest ones, the dam area is clear cut. And in these flatland twos, some of the time that's your biggest problem. You can't find any workable structure. There's trees and stumps and hangs everywhere you turn. So it's important that we establish that in order to catch fish consistently, we have to have workable structure. I don't want to spend half my day trying to get my lures unhung. I want clean, workable structure. Well, the dam offers that. I already know that going in. And another good thing about the dam is I don't need a contour map. I can see it. I can get on a road map, find out where the dam is, take the highway, go right to it. Get the closest ramp, and when I get out on the water, I can see, the, I can see my structure. I can drive right to it. I don't have to be out in the middle of the lake two or three miles out trying to follow a side feed of stream cut where it meets the old channel so I can find that two-sided bar. The dam I can see visually. I can just see it. Don't need a map. And go right to it and start my fishing. Knowing that it will produce, number one, and number two, it's clean, workable structure. Now I'm going to go to man-made structure number two, a causeway. One that crosses the lake and at some point intersects with the main river channel. We know it'll produce fish. That's a guarantee. Another advantage is the first one I just talked about with the dam. I can see a causeway. I don't need a contour map. I can see it. What I know about that causeway, it leads all the way, it'll produce fish, and when that reservoir was flooded, they clear cut that area. There are no trees along that causeway. I have clean, workable structure that I already know will produce fish, guaranteed. It leads from the shallows to the deep, to the channel. Now keep in mind, you really have to zero in on this channel thing when you're talking about a flatland too, because there are not great depths available in these reservoirs. Many times the deepest water in that channel is going to be 30 feet. 35 feet, the further you get upstream, it's going to even be less than that. 25 feet, 24 feet. You better believe that's the home of the fish. That's not as much water as they want, but it's the deepest they've got. So your channel is so key as we interpret this Flatland II Reservoir. I'm trying to pick the best structures, but I know that everything has to begin at that channel. If my structure doesn't lead to that channel, it will not produce fish, period. The dam leads and so does the causeway. So now I've given you two super structures to fish in a flatland tube reservoir. Uh, trust me on this one. 
in many cases, that's all the further you need to go. Get your roadmap, go to the causeway, and go to the dam. You don't have to do anything else. In addition to that man-made structure, let me go a step further. How about a submerged roadbed? Many of these flatland reservoirs have a submerged roadbed that crosses the lake at some place. Now, if it crosses a real shallow feed or cut somewhere, I'm not interested in that one. If I have anything, uh, the lower half or the lower two-thirds of a reservoir and I still have greater than 20 feet of water and I have a roadbed that crosses over again. Now, I can't visibly see that, but with the help of my depth sonder, I can surely find it. And another thing about these submerged roadbeds, there was no trees growing on the roadbed. It's not only productive structure, it leads all the way from the channel to the shallows. It leads all the way at some point. So we know it's productive structure, but more importantly, it's workable structure. It's clean. And then we can add to that, since we're on the roadbed, let's add to a railroad grade. Can't tell you how many railroad grades have been the secret to my success for years. So many of the reservoirs that I've uh, done during my promotions. You, you wouldn't believe how many times the key was an underwater railroad grade. Again, these railroad grades are built and they're cleared off. You don't have trees growing up uh, through the old railroad tracks. There ain't no trees. So not only is it productive structure, but it's workable structure. So now what we have, we have the dam, we have the causeway. We have underwater roadbed, submerged roadbed, submerged railroad grades, man-made structure. These are your keys. And for the most part, a lot of what it represents is that it's clean. We can work our lures. We can work the bottom, which if you've been around me for very long, you know we, I want my lure on the bottom 100% of the time, period. Regardless of the species I'm after, I want my lure on the bottom. And if every two minutes I'm getting hung up in a tree or a stump or something like that, I'm not real happy. So finding clean, going to what you know is clean, workable structure in a flatland too is key. Like I said, many of the new flatland twos, they don't even clear cut. Forget about it. The only clear areas are the ones that I've just mentioned to you. And they've got a lot of standing trees all over the reservoir. Had somebody belly aching not too long ago about Lake Fork and all the trees. Well, Buck's favorite statement is get out of the trees. Not that there is not a fish in an area like that, but it's almost impossible to fish effectively. So when he says get out of the trees, he's talking about find you some clean, workable structure so that you can go to work and, and be successful. And all you got to do is go to some of these big flatlands and watch these guys with their soft plastics work in the trees, middle of summer. It, it's, it's just, it's sad. Find you some workable structure that leads from the channel to the shallows that gives the fish a route and go to work. And I've given you four of my favorite places in life to fish. Now I'm going to give you something else. Also very important when you're talking about these big, huge flatland two impoundments. One of your worst enemies, if you're living and fishing, so I have so many friends in Texas. I've done so many schools down here, but I have so many friends in Texas. And they always complain about the wind. And rightfully so. Nothing can mess you up more than a heavy wind. Not only does it eliminate some areas that you could have otherwise been fishing, but it also uh, hinders your ability to be precise in your presentation of lures. Wind is horrible. It was Buck's least favorite thing in fishing. He hated the wind. But it's also a way of life with us that if we're living and fishing Flatland 2 reservoirs, we better come to grips with the fact that most of the time we're going to have some wind. It's because of the areas where these reservoirs are built. You're going to have some wind. So as we begin to analyze this situation, which we know is, is a given, you're going to have some wind in the Flatland 2. And because of those shallow flats, when, when it blows up, 
it's nothing to see four footers out there on these on these flatland reservoirs. It becomes like an ocean and becomes in some cases dangerous, uh, just dangerous to be out there. And it's going to happen. So if I'm living on a flatland two reservoir, I'm going to do some general interpretations over my time on the water to pinpoint if the wind's out of the north, where am I going to fish? If it's out of the east, where am I going to fish? If it's out of the south, where's my number one spot? That's how I do a, a general interpretation of my lake. I have to consider the wind. It's something that's going to happen. Just like when I'm interpreting a Florida type lake, I know what I've got. Many cases, my deepest water, 15, 16 feet. I've only got what I've got. Well, when you're living out in Texas or out in Oklahoma or Arkansas or some of these uh, other big valley areas where you have these huge flatland two reservoirs, Sardis, let's go to Mississippi, Sardis, Grenada, all these reservoirs I have fished, you can have a wind problem and you've got to know if this is your Saturday, the day that you're off of work and you can go fishing and you see that wind's coming from 20 mile an hour from the north, you better start your plotting. Start your fishing before you go out to the lake. In that case, I might be fishing the south side of the causeway. That means I'll have lee water to fish. Or if the wind's out of the south and the dam is built east and west, I know if the wind's out of the south coming up across that dam, I have lee water at the dam. So wind out of the south, I know where I'm going. I'm going to my dam. And those are just a couple of examples. You can have in these flatlands, you can have some really large side feeder stream rivers, side feeder stream cuts that come in that have plenty of water in the side feeder stream cut. My example I gave out in Tawakini when I fished that, the side cut had 45 feet of water in it. And where we had a bar, <coughs> actually where we had a finger of a bar, that was quite a distance, 100 yards or so, or maybe even 200 yards up from the contact point, they hit that finger, and rather than go all the way back, they just dropped into the feeder cut. And every morning at 8 o'clock, they popped their head up on that, on that finger. So many times, you'll have a feeder cut, and let's say, to, let's say this feeder cut is, is lying east to west, and you got a north wind. Well, you're going to go to the north side of that feeder stream cut and locate your structure there so you have some lee water you can actually go fishing. Or vice versa. If it's out of the south, you're going to get to the south side of that cut. Which cut has better structure on the north side, the east, the west, the south? That's how you interpret what you're going to do about this wind. But many times, your man-made structure is going to cover you from that wind many many times and as I look back on my career when I was promoting I've explained this many times but I knew that if I was going to do a school or if I was going to do a big lecture in a in a big city I had to fish the closest big impoundment I had to fish their lake bottom line and have a lot of success on their lake to develop the interest to get people to come to hear the message about structure fishing. I had to do that. So the number one guy to call, of course, was the writer of the newspaper. He had the biggest pool by his articles in the outdoor section of the paper. On Sundays, I always have a big full page. So he was a guy to get a hold of and challenged. Come out with me. Take me to your reservoir out here and we'll be catching fish in the first hour. Guarantee it. And they would come. And if I couldn't get a writer, in an area. I would personally go around until I found the biggest tackle dealer in the city. And then I'd make him the same offer. I want to take you fishing. And I guarantee you, one hour we'll be catching fish. How in the world could I do that? How did I get away with that for years? <laughs> because we have the weather and water conditions and all the things we talked about before that I had to contend with, but how did I get away with it? I'm going to tell you how. Thanks for being with me today. I hope you learned a little something. I want you to be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to our channel here if you haven't already done it. Thanks for being with me today, and we'll see you the next time.